I invite you to take your Bible this morning, if you would please, and look with me to Luke's Gospel, chapter 10. Beautiful reading this morning. Thank you for that. Setting the stage for our study this morning, uh, entitled Loving Our Neighbor. Let me ask you a question this morning. When was the last time, think about this, when was the last time you were on the receiving end of a loving act? Think about that. When was the last time you were on the receiving end of a loving act? We've had a lot of rain. Uh, I think you probably have a little more here than we, we're about an, uh, 40 minutes north of you here. Though we spend a lot of time in West Virginia, I have 79 pretty much memorized every twist and turn as we make our way down there a couple times a month, heading back down on Wednesday. But um, uh, a lot of rain, and as a consequence, what happens when it rains? You have to do what? Anybody find that a, a bit challenging? Some of us do. Uh, we have a lot of hillsides and divots, big divots, and it's kind of hard to mow our yard, to say the least. But it's, it's a job, and we get it done. And uh, But just think about this. Let's imagine you're on a trip. You're going to vacation. I'm not sure where people in Washington vacation. A lot of people uh, down south go to Myrtle Beach or Virginia Beach or somewhere like that. Let's imagine you've gone away for, for eight or nine days, and, of course, you've had a lot of rain in Pennsylvania. And as a consequence... Uh, what happens? The grass goes from here to where? <laughs> Just like that, right? Overnight, it seems. But you come back, and all of a sudden, you notice somebody's taken initiative to mow my grass. Now, that would be an act of love, right? Yes or no? I think so. Um, I'm going to be gone next week, and if you want my address, I'll... No, just kidding. An act of love. Let's imagine you're, you're eating out, and a lot of people like to eat out after church, and, and, and you're getting ready to pay the bill, and all of a sudden you notice that uh, somebody's picked up your tab. Anybody good with that? <laughs> That'd be good, wouldn't it? That's a loving act, right? It's happened to me once or twice, and I've had the privilege of being able to do that. I did it for a lady about six months ago, and she was 85 years old. She said, this is the first time this has ever happened in my life. Can you imagine that, living 85 years and no one ever picking up your tab? The stimulus checks, you remember those? We were taxed on them, by the way, just FYI. It wasn't all that it supposedly was cracked up to be. But anyhow, I knew of a, a couple that were aware of another couple who, whose income stream had been interrupted because of the lack of uh, employment. Their jobs were interrupted. One had lost his job, and as a consequence, this couple said, you know, we really weren't anticipating this check, so we don't need it. And so they gave it to the couple whose income had been interrupted by COVID and, of course, all the other things that have been going on. We uh, work in a really poor area in West Virginia, a place called uh, Falling Rock, and uh, it's so far back they pump sunshine in and moonshine out. That's how far back it is. And uh, this uh, couple, they've done very well over the years. They live now in Murfreesboro, Tennessee. She grew up in that holler. Did you see that shirt? You stay in your holler, I'll stay in mine. That was kind of cool, wasn't it? So they lived up a holler, and, and, and they've done extremely well over the years. And as a consequence, when they got their stimulus check, they said, Jess, would you mind making sure that these resources go to Falling Rock? And we had about three different projects going on up there. And so as a consequence, we were able to make sure that those resources got to the very location where she had suggested. Jesus, uh, more than one occasion, talked about the greatest of the commandments. And uh, on one occasion, Jesus was asked the question, what is the greatest of the commandments? And Jesus said, you're to love the Lord your God with all your heart and all your soul and all your mind. And, and the second is like unto it, you're to love your neighbor as you love yourself. He says, upon these two hang the law and the prophets. Now, on our occasion here in Luke's Gospel, we find a guy that's um, trying to place Jesus in a predicament, in the horns of a dilemma, if you will. And, and, and we see his question is a question, but it's an insincere question because he's not really seeking truth. He's trying to somehow or another box Jesus in so as to make him look 
less credible. That's the motive. I, I think it's very clear as we look at the verse. Notice with me in chapter 10, Luke's Gospel, verse 25. And a certain lawyer or a teacher of the law, not we think of lawyers, we think of Edgar Snyder, right? It's not that kind of a lawyer. It's an expert in the Old Testament, okay? He, he, he stood up putting him to the test. That's his motive right there, right? I'd underline that word. If you mark your Bible, it's a good thing to mark your Bible, I think. He's testing the Lord Jesus, trying to put him in a box, trying to place him in a negative light. That's his motive. He said, teacher, what must I do? To inherit eternal life. Now again, Jesus was never boxed in nor trapped. He's the all-knowing Son of God. And he, he queer, clearly answers the question uh, in, in a perhaps a little different way than we might anticipate. But um, it's very clear here that he is seeking to test the Lord Jesus. Martin Luther is a name you probably have some familiarity with. He said these words, a Christian is someone who lives outside himself. He lives in Christ by faith and in his neighbor by and in love. Think about that for just a moment. Most of us know the greatest of the commandments. The second commandment, like unto it, love your neighbor as yourself. We know where it is in the Bible. We know certainly it's here in Luke's Gospel, chapter 10, and other places as well. For example, Matthew chapter 22. Most of us can read it. Some of us perhaps can even quote it. But the real question this morning is simply this. How close do we come to living it? Think about that for a moment. How close do we come to living it? Do we love God with every fiber of our being? Do we love Him in totality? Do we love Him with our heart, soul, mind, and spirit? And secondly, do we love our neighbor in the same manner and measure as we love ourselves? Think about that. Again, we can read it, we can quote it. But the real question is this, how close do we come to living it? How close do we come to living it? You know, Jesus didn't utter these kinds of words just to somehow or another take up space on a page, but rather to take up residence within our hearts. That there might be a change on the inside that would somehow or another be reflected on the outside. So here, as we look to this, uh, this uh, parable of, of loving our neighbor, we, we find this insincere question, and Jesus begins to chip away in a very skillful way to answer it. And the second part of the story is what I refer to here in your notes as the insightful, the insightful answer. Notice how he responds. So he, he, he says, teacher, what must I do to inherit eternal life? And he said unto him, Jesus speaking, what is written in the law? How do you read it? Now, that's a great place. If you ever encounter somebody and you're in a spiritual conversation, one of the best things you could possibly do is to direct them back to the scriptures. And that's exactly what the Lord Jesus does here. So he says, uh, uh, what, what's written in the law and how do you read it? And so this uh, young man answers the question. And he says, okay, you're to love the Lord your God with the entirety of your being and you're to love your neighbor as yourself. Jesus responds to him and says, you've answered correctly. Do this and you will live. Now, again, keep in mind the motive behind the question is to trip him up, that is to trip up the Lord Jesus, to somehow or another diminish his credibility. And so this is not a sincere seeker, this is an adversary seeking to show some measure of inferiority of a response on the part of the Lord Jesus. Now notice his question. What must I do to inherit eternal life? It would appear on the basis of this question that this Old Testament expert believes that eternal life is based upon what? A certain number of meritorious acts as if to imply somehow or another salvation is by works. But we know that's not the case. Not by works of righteousness, the Bible says over in Titus chapter 3. Not by works of righteousness, which we have done, but according to... To, to, to his mercy we have been saved by the cleansing of regeneration and the renewing work of the Holy Spirit. For by grace are you saved through faith, that not of yourselves, it's the gift of God, not of works, 
lest any man should boast. So Jesus doesn't quibble over the uh, contradiction in the question, implied in the question. You see, you can't do something to inherit a gift. For a gift to be a gift, it's not something you work for, it's not something you earn, it's not something you deserve. You just are on the receiving end of the gracious act of somebody else. And that's what grace is. G-R-A-C-E. God's riches at Christ's expense. That's the acrostic. So Jesus says, uh, what's written in the Word? He said, you love God with your entire being. You love your neighbor as yourself. Uh, Jesus said, you've answered correctly. However, there's one huge problem. It's a good answer, but it's impossible to do. Nobody can do that. No one has ever loved God with his entire being, nor has any of us loved our neighbor as ourselves. Now let me sort of translate verse 28. As you look carefully here this morning with me and observe it, it'll give you a sense of what's being said. Present tense verb form, we can translate it like this. Okay, do that and keep on doing that without a single lapse or failure at any point in your earthly life and you shall live. Right? Only problem is we can't do it, right? No person can perfectly obey the demands that are set forth here. We must seek divine mercy. We must seek help from the outside. We've all taken the test. We've flunked the course, and God doesn't grade on the curve. Is in essence what he's saying. You see, eternal life is not about engaging in a series of religious acts or or something of that nature. It's more about a heart relationship with the living and true God through His Son, Jesus Christ, through the great exchange that He did for us, God making His Son, who knew no sin, to be sin for us, that we might be the righteousness of God in Him. It's a borrowed, imputed righteousness. So eternal life is not about engaging in a series of, of religious acts. So he continues in this unsuccessful quest to somehow or another place the Lord Jesus on the horns of the dilemma. So he sort of feels the searchlight of, of Christ's all knowingness, his omniscience, as he's reading this young man like an open book. And so he tries to take the heat off. And so he asks a question Well, well who is it then? Is my neighbor? He's trying to justify himself. Notice verse 29 wishing to justify himself, he said to Jesus, Who's my neighbor? Scribes and Pharisees had a very narrow view of what a neighbor was. They believed a neighbor would be a fellow family member or somebody that would attend worship with you at the synagogue or the temple. Many of the Jews in Jesus' day actually believed that Gentile folk and certainly Samaritans were created to feed the fires of hell. That's what kind of animosity they had toward um, the Gentile population. But let's look at how Jesus responds in this insightful answer uh, in verse 30. So he asks a question, the man trying to justify himself, and Jesus responds and says, a certain man was going down from Jerusalem to Jericho, fell among robbers, and they stripped him, and they beat him, And they went off, leaving him half dead. And by chance, a certain priest was going down on that road from Jerusalem to Jericho. And when he saw him, he passed by on the other side. And likewise, a Levite, when he came to the place and saw him, he passed by on the other side. The uh, Jerusalem road, I've actually seen parts of it. When you think about Jerusalem, it sets up high, about 3,400 feet above sea level. Jericho is below sea level, so there's a huge gradient. And, of course, Jericho is to the north of, um, of Jerusalem. It was a very treacherous 17 miles of, of road that made anyone traveling that road uh, certainly a candidate for pillage and plunder. That's exactly what happens here. Now, it's interesting that Jesus doesn't spend in this parable a lot of time talking about the depravity of man in terms of the robbers. He doesn't spend much time on that at all. But what we do notice here, this man that had been attacked was literally 
uh, gasping for his last breath. He was nearly dead. He was brutally beaten, robbed, vandalized, left for dead, beaten to an inch of his life. And Jesus begins to help us understand very clearly what it means to love one's neighbor. To take the second commandment personally and seriously. In addition to that, we see in this story, in this parable, three kinds of people that existed 2,000 years ago, three kinds of people that exist today. There are takers, and there are keepers, and there are givers. The thieves in the story, we don't have much to go on here in terms of detail, but they're takers. And we have takers today. For example, a person might be in a conversation with somebody, and though uh, this person might not like this other person that's being talked about, they might say something that's sort of like a a well-timed, well-placed, derogatory, unnecessary word. When that takes place, that's the act of a taker. When a person at work maneuvers to the point when it comes to that review, that annual review or promotion, and and he does so real artfully and and discreetly, yet uh, ignoring everybody else and everything else just to position himself so that he might get the great uh, marks on the annual review, that person is a taker. We think of um, what's happening in the Ukraine. We have a granddaughter that's Ukrainian. She's coming home today. She's over there with her father. They're doing some things to help people in a satellite country uh, that had to flee for their lives. We think of Vladimir Putin and what he's doing in terms of trying to annex the Ukraine. He's a taker. So in this life that we live in, there are people who are takers. They existed back then. They exist now. And, And there are people who are keepers. Let's look at those folks, the second group of people here, the priest and the Levite in the story. Notice what happens here. And by chance, verse 31, a certain priest was going down on the road, and and, and he saw him. He saw that man that was all beat to a pulp, and he passed by on the other side. And likewise, the Levite, when he came to the place, saw him and passed by on the other side. Keepers. We have keepers today. We had keepers then. People who hold on to things. People who, who love live in their own undisturbed, tight space of security and serenity. People who, 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 who don't like interruptions in their life. They like their tidy, tight, self-directed life. And that was the case here in the instance of the priest and the Levite. Think about it. I see how the priest kind of justified. You know, he'd been on an eight-day rotation in Jerusalem, wanted to see the family. This man's half dead. If the man were to die, he would have to go through all kinds of of Levitical rituals to get back to a place where he could serve uh, ceremonially unclean if this man were to die. And so he's saying, you know, I'm just a priest. I'm not a paramedic. I'm just going to walk on by. And that's exactly what he does. Lest we become too critical, how many people this past month have we just walked on by? Think about it. Legitimate need. It's obvious you have the wherewithal to to address that need, but, but instead of addressing the need, you just walk on by. Don't want to be inconvenienced. Don't want any interruptions in my life. Listen, ministries involve, <laughs> involves interruptions. I can tell you that. If we love our neighbor as ourselves, then we're going to have interruptions. For him to lend a hand would have mean major interruption. He's saying, you know, I'm a priest. I'm not a paramedic. He's probably going to die anyhow, so he just walks on by. Loving himself. Not so much loving his neighbor. Loving yourself and ignoring your neighbor's need. It's easy to do, isn't it? Now let's think for just a moment. Let's imagine he walks out of the synagogue or the temple in Jerusalem. 
And there's a crowd of people, and there's a man that's left there on the street half dead. What might he have done in that instance with the crowds watching ever so closely his every move? We need to know that nothing escapes the all-seeing eye of the living and true God, right? Never. So in this story and in our lives, there are people who are takers. There are people who are keepers. And thankfully, there are people who do what's right. Look at verse 33. And a certain Samaritan who was on a journey saw him. He had the capacity to see him. And when he saw him, he felt compassion. He came to him. He bandaged his wounds and poured oil and wine on them and put him on his own beast and brought him to an inn and took care of him. And on the next day, took out two denarii. That's about a week's wage. Gave it to the innkeeper. Says, whatever it takes, let's get this guy back on his feet. You'll notice in your notes, we mentioned something about three ingredients to biblical compassion what time do you guys usually get done what time do you get done usually help me out here 11 30 is that right is that right help me out yep okay we'll be done by 11 30 i promise you're relieved i can just see it on your faces it's like that one preacher who said you know Somebody accused me of being long-winded. He says, I might be long, but I don't get winded. (laughs) What have you done on time? I know that uh, Cracker Barrel's calling. Right? So when you think about biblical compassion, let's get back to the text. It involves what? It involves the ability to see people, people with needs. When I was a pastor in Kansas City in the 80s, I had a guy in my church who... Who, who, who had a, a little bit to go on, a little extra to go on. And so he would look at people's shoes. And if a person had shoes which, which had half a heel, he'd go out and buy them a pair of shoes. The capacity to see people. That's what's involved in biblical compassion. We see it here very clearly. It says, when he saw him, he felt compassion. The second ingredient to biblical compassion is this. The capacity to have your heart moved. Capacity to have your heart moved. This past uh, week and a half, when we were down in West Virginia, there was a little boy. He was brought from another state by his grandfather. His older brother had just shot his biological father between the eyes with a gun. His head was hung low, and he was just, just a mess as he came. I pulled him aside and I said, "We'll call him Jimmy. Jimmy, did you get a shirt?" No, I didn't didn't get a shirt. They don't fit me. I said, let's go over and find you a shirt. So we went over and found a shirt. Next day, we had like thousands of dollars of toys and stuff to give to the kids at the picnic. So I picked out a real nice ball and bat, and I set it on on a chair in the area where we were meeting, our meeting room. And so I said, "Uh, Jimmy, go over, and, and that's yours. Go put it in your grandfather's truck. And he did. At the end of the week, he came up to me and said, Jesse, Guess what? I said, what? He said, I'm going to be baptized. His pastor was there on the trip as well. I said, I said, did you ask Jesus to be your Savior? He said, I did. I did. And he turned to me and he said, he said, do you mind if I give you a hug? (laughs) Do you mind if I give you a hug? little boy went from a horrific place, and no doubt his life is still going to be complicated. But he knows Christ is his Savior. Heaven is now his home. His sins are forgiven. He has the assurance of eternal life. He will make it. He will make it. He is a child of God. You see, we have to have the capacity to see people. And a willingness and a capacity to have our, our hearts move. Third ingredient is this. A willingness to go out of your way. So your neighbor's away for three weeks and maybe there's been a hospitalization and the grass is growing. What are you going to do? You say, I can't mow it. Well, you could pay for somebody to mow it for them. 
That would speak loudly, would it not? Would that not be an act of compassion? Would that not be an act where you are loving your neighbor as you love yourself? You see, in this world we live in, there are three kinds of people. There are takers. The church is not exempt from this either, by the way. There are takers and there are keepers, like that tidy life without interruptions. But there are givers. So the Samaritan sees this man half dead. It makes no difference what race he's, he is. He, he gets down low. He, he bends over. He, he disinfects his wounds with wine and oil. He lifts him up as best he can, places him on the back of the beast of burden, and leads him to a small community where this man could be on the receiving end of care. I'd say that's an interruption, isn't it? A place where healing could begin. A place where comfort could be administered. Notice verse 35. He goes out on a limb here financially. And on the next day, he took out two denarii, about a week's wage, gave it to the innkeeper and said, hey, take care of him and whatever else it takes, whatever it takes, I'll repay when I get back. Listen. We are to love God with every inch of our being with our mind and our strength and our soul and our spirit. And we're to love our neighbors in the same manner, in the same measure as we care for ourselves. Listen, it's clear in the story that love doesn't look away. Love doesn't turn away. Love doesn't walk away. It doesn't come up with some creative excuse why I can just walk on by. See, in Christ, you don't need a reason to help people. When you're born again, it's programmed into your spiritual DNA where you have the capacity to see people. And you have the capacity to have your heart moved and you have the capacity to go out of your way. True story. At the end of World War II... One of the saddest sights in England were all the orphans strewn through the city streets, wandering through the war-torn streets aimlessly night and day. One chilly morning, a USGI came around the corner in his Jeep just finishing up his, his shift, and he noticed a little boy, a little English boy, with his, his nose pressed up against the plate glass of a pastry shop. And the little boy was watching every move that that baker was making as he was getting ready to do a new batch of donuts. The fellow walked up, the GI walked up and said, Son, son, would, would you like some of those? Oh, would I like some of those? Yes. So the GI went in, bought a bag of donuts, walked back out, presented them to that little boy, began to make his way back to the Jeep when he felt a, a tug on the edge of his trench coat as the little boy looked up into his eyes and he said, Mister, are you God? Are you God? You see, there was something in that little boy's observance of that man. Something that that man had done in a loving act. And it was simply the giving of himself for the benefit of that little boy. Living by the second commandment. Loving one's neighbor as himself. You see, we're never more like God than when we give. So as we think about the story, there are takers. And there are keepers. And there are givers. Which of those three words best describe you? Honestly, be honest with yourself. We're not playing games. This, this is too important 
The Bible says this over in 1 John chapter 3, verses 16 through 18. By this we perceive the love of God because He laid down His life for us. We ought to lay down our lives for the brethren. Whoever has this world's goods and sees his brother in need and, and shuts up his, his compassion from him, how does the love of God dwell in him? My little children, let us not love in word or in tongue, but in deed and in truth. Amen? There's two of you awake. The Samaritan is an incarnate portrait of what it means to love your neighbor as yourself. Notice at the end of the notes here, some of you do some reading. There's a fellow by the name of John Piper. Notice what he writes as we share it with you. He says these words, fight for us, O God, that we not numbly and blindly and foolishly drift into empty excitements. Life is too short, too precious, too painful to waste on worldly bubbles that burst. Heaven is too great. Hell is too terrible. Eternity is too long that we should potter around the porch of eternity. Listen. You and I need to love God as if there's no tomorrow. And we're to love our neighbor in the same way, the same measure as we love ourselves. He says it's fairly high. It is a high standard. But by the Spirit of God, Third person, the triune God who lives within each of us as believers, we can do better than what we've done. In lowliness of mind, let each of you esteem others as more important than himself. Look not on each man to his own interest, but, but each man to the interest of others. Love God as if there's no tomorrow. Love your neighbor in the same measure, in the same manner as you love yourself. Would you bow with me as we pray? Well, to the thief, the man on the Jericho Road was, was a victim to exploit. And to the priest and the Levite, he was a nuisance to avoid. To the lawyer, he was a problem to discuss. But to the, na- to the Samaritan and to you and to me, he's a neighbor to serve. Three kinds of people. There are takers, there are keepers, and there are givers. And we're never more like God than when we give. Compassion. Contact, care for those who are in need. The challenge, we didn't see it. Jesus said, go and do the same. Which man proved himself to be a a, a neighbor, the one who showed mercy and compassion? Jesus said, go and do likewise. Go and do the same. Demonstrate compassion. Be inconvenienced. Let go of those things that you're holding so tightly to. See people where they are. Allow your heart to be moved. And be willing. Be willing to go out of your way. Well, God, there's a work to be done in me. There's a work to be done in your people. For us to get to the place of truly loving our neighbor as we love ourselves. We do a fairly good job in loving ourselves, Lord. We need help big time when it comes to loving our neighbor in the same manner and by the same measure and to loving you as we should. Continue to do your work in each of us by your Holy Spirit. Use the word to convict. May you uh, do such a work in our lives, Lord, that, that the Christ-likeness that, that was seen in the Samaritan might be seen in us.
that we would walk even as Jesus walked, that we'd live even as Jesus lived. And we ask all these things in his matchless name. Amen.